motion. Thank you. Always run this show pretty pace. we talk about last time uh, the root of sin is selfishness? Selfishness. Selfishness. We're all selfish. I'm selfish. Pretty sad how selfish we are, huh? Yes. Well, welcome. I know that's you, Mom. I see one person. I knew it was my mom. Hi, Mom. Krista says, hey, I didn't see who it was, but I knew it was you, Mom best mom ever. Sorry, everybody else's mom. So we talked about the root of sin was selfishness last time. And we saw that it was a principle that governs the heart. And that to get rid of the selfishness, which drives us to sin, we need to have a heart change, which takes place through the Holy Spirit. Today, we are going to talk about perfect submission in the example of Abraham. Let's see, we got Cindy here, we got Krista here, we got my mom here. I think that's pretty good. I think we could probably get started with uh, the group of us. Okay, so normally this is where we ask the pretty lady to come and sit with us. Right now she's feeling a little under the weather, so we're going to leave her be. But she's right there, so I'm going to reach over and hold her hand. And I'm going to say, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just stop and thank you for our privilege to study the Bible together as a family. And Lord, as your word is sound and true and perfect, we ask that you would shape and mold us through your word and through the spirit. So Heavenly Father, would you please protect us? Would you set a hedge of protection around us? Would you bless us with your spirit in a double, triple, quadruple portion? And would you help us to see how to come out of Babylon through the experience of Abraham? In Jesus' name. So we're going to look at coming out of Babylon through the experience of Abraham and how he did that was being perfectly submitted to God's word. And I want to thank everybody for coming. I know that sometimes we got to hustle just to get uh, to Bible study. And I pray that the Lord would bless your efforts as you join us to study God's word. So. Here we go. We're going to study perfect submission in the life of Abraham as Abraham came out of Babylon. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Hebrews eleven eight 8 says this. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and he went out not knowing where he went you see abraham was called out from his homeland which we're going to see in a moment he was called to go to a land which he did not go which he did not know and as he went he went by faith and as he went by faith he submitted his life to the voice of god to the word of god and as he submitted his life to god to the voice of god to the word of god it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, where did, Be uh, where did Abraham come from? Abraham came from a place called Ur of the Chaldees. And as we're going to see in scripture, Ur of the Chaldees is like the New York of New York City. It is the place, it's the central focal point of Babylon. So when God calls Abraham out of Ur, out of Chaldees, He's literally calling Abraham out of Babylon. And that is quite interesting because we too are called out of Babylon. Now, what was ancient Babylon, right? What was ancient Babylon? And if you do a historical study of ancient Babylon, you're going to see that ancient Babylon was a kingdom, but it was also a religion. It was a, a mystical, idolatrous religion. Babylon in the time of Abraham was the universal center of worship, specifically paganism disguised as worship of the one true God. I'm going to say that again, is that 
Babylon religion was mystical. It was idolatrous. And in the time of Abraham, it was the center focal point for paganism disguised as worship of the one true God. This is what the Bible says about Babylon. Jeremiah 51, 7. Jeremiah 51, 7. This is what it says. Jeremiah 51, 7 says this. Let's go back even one. Jeremiah 51, 6. Flee, flee, run, get out of Babylon. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Babylon hath made a golden cup, hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Very, very, very important to understand what Babylon was. It was a mystical, idol, idolatrous religion. It took paganism and masked it disguised it as worship of the one true God. And this is what it says. It says that all the earth, the whole world became drunk. All the nations have drunken of her wine, of drunken of her teaching. And therefore the nations are mad. The nations have become confused because of these false teachings of Babylon. And the wine of Babylon was her mystical teachings about God. Right? Babylon taught a specific view of God, which confused the minds as if it was drunk. Right? The people who worshipped in the Babylonian system became confused about the one true God. And the teaching of Babylon destroyed families. The teachings of Babylon prevented the Heavenly Father's blessings from falling upon mankind. The teachings of Babylon left a deep sense of worthlessness and fear as people viewed God through the Babylonian teachings, right? These false understandings, they gave a false view of who God was. And as they focused on God in a perverted, in a confused, in a false way, they looked at God as focusing on power when really the one true God, the Father, he focuses on love. So this Babylonian teaching, which warps and contorts the character of the one true God, the Father, it focuses this false understanding of God. It focuses and says that God is worried about power, when really the Holy Scripture says that God is focused on love. Babylon and its teachings develop inhumanity and anger towards God. This is in a large sense, seen today. The Babylonian teachings, the false teachings of Christianity create, develop inside humanity anger towards God. A false teaching misleads people's understanding of who God really is, right? Putting God in a false light, giving God a character that doesn't belong to him. Babylon portrays God as an evil angry, vengeful tyrant looking for perfection from sinful humans who don't have the capability of being perfect. I'm going to say that again. The false teachings of Babylon mislead people's understanding of who God really is, right? They have this false understanding of God, thinking that he's vengeful, that he's spiteful, that he's a tyrant, and that he's looking for perfection from humans who are sinners who don't have the capability of being perfect. This is what Satan's plan was for Babylon. Satan's plan for Babylon was to destroy the image of God in man. And as Satan destroyed the image of God in man, he stripped humanity of their dignity. Because in God, being in the image of Christ, that gives humanity dignity. And Satan sought to strip this from humanity. He sought to enslave humanity with the purposes of joining Satan's army in his war against God. That's what the Babylonian system does. It strips man of his dignity as being shaped and formed in the image of God. And it enslaves man with false teachings, 
fills him with anger and hatred to a, a misunderstanding of the one true God, and then captures the human and enslaves him in Satan's army so that he then goes to war against God. That's what the Babylonian teaching does. Very important to understand that. We're not getting into the deep uh, understandings. We're going to see that this ancient Babylon, this ancient Babylonian religion, uh, we're not going to dig into that. We're actually just going to look in and see how God delivered Abraham out of it. And we want to understand that as ancient Babylon was the birthplace of a false religion, which warped man's understanding of God, destroyed the image of God in man, so too spiritual Babylon, end time spiritual Babylon, would be the ultimate fulfillment of this false religion, right? Spiritual end time Babylon, the ultimate fulfillment of what was started by Nimrod at the Tower of Babel, right around the time Abraham was born. This false understanding confuses the mind of God, uh, the, confuses the minds of people with a misunderstanding of the true character of God and creates within man an anger and hatred towards the one true God. And God calls us in his word to come out of this end time spiritual fallen confused system revelation 14 8 god says we need to come out of this false understanding of who he is revelation 14 8 revelation chapter 14 verse 8 says this and there followed another angel saying babylon is fallen is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen because she has fallen away from biblical truth. We've studied this before. If you're with us up to this point and you've gone through the Babylonian studies, you know that Babylon is apostate Christianity typified in the papacy. We see that the papacy says that he is above the Bible. And that proof of this fact is that he changed the Sabbath. Very important to understand who Babylon, end time spiritual Babylon is. It's, it's, it's apostate Christianity, typified in the papacy, right? And God says to come out of apostate Christianity. These principles that were started in ancient Babylon have found their way through satanic deception into Christianity. And now modern Christianity, modern Christianity right now is this ancient pagan religion of Babylon. And no one knows it. Revelation 18, 1 to 4. Revelation 18, 1 to 4. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon... The great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice saying, another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that she received not her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Babylon, apostate Christianity, has infiltrated the entire world. And this spirit that drives Babylon is the spirit of devils. And so much so has this spirit of devils infiltrated Christianity worldwide that it has infected the merchants and the kings of the earth. This false system of Babylonian worship with a cloak of Christianity has changed the whole world. It's caused the whole world to gone mad. And we are seeing it being played out as we speak. God tells us to come out of these end time apostate Christian systems. And he gave us an example on how to do that. The example that he gave us is the life of Abraham. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. This is why God gives us examples in the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 says this. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples. All those things that happened in the Old Testament, those things happened as examples. Why? And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world came. So all those things that happened in the Old Testament, they happened as examples for us to learn from those of us who live in the end times. This is very important. Very, very important. As God called Abraham out of Babylon, as God calls us out of Babylon, we have an example to learn from. In God's mercy, in God's love for humanity, God calls a man out of ancient Babylon and completely removes from his mind all traces of Babylonian false worship, all traces of Babylon false worship and influence from this man's life, from this man's mind. God is able to, in one generation, I'll say that again, in one generation, remove every Babylonian influence, every Babylonian false set of worship, and he can transform this one man into somebody who worships the character and worships the one true God and reflects his character perfectly. This is Abraham, the example that God gave to us, right? In these last days of spiritual Babylon, end time spiritual Babylon, we can look at the life of Abraham and see how did he come out of Babylon? What did he do to let go of the Babylonian influences in his life? And how can we apply these same examples to ours? It is completely possible to come out of spiritual Babylon. And as Abraham developed a loving, nurturing, submissive life that reflected the life and character of Christ, so too can we if we follow his example. Abraham. His name changes from Abram to Abraham. So if I make that mistake, that's, it's an accident. I'm so used to calling him Abraham that sometimes I forget that his name was Abram. So if I make a mistake, please forgive me. But Abram, Abraham, he lived shortly after the time of Nimrod. This is very important to understand because Nimrod was the high priest. Nimrod was the king of Babylon. He's the one that got the ball rolling. He's the one that started the Tower of Babel, right? And we see that um, Abraham comes from the same territory. Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. Genesis chapter 11, verse 31 says this, And Terah, that's Abraham's father, And Terah took Abraham his son, and Lot the son of Abraham's brother, and his son's son, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So Abraham is from Ur from the land of the Chaldees. Let's check this out. Ezekiel 12, 13. Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 13, tells us exactly where Ur from the Chaldees was. Ezekiel 12, 13 says this, And the prince that is among them shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight. Hmm. I, I'm sorry, I went to the wrong one. Uh, Ezekiel 12, 13. My net also will I spread upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet shall he not see it, though he shall die there. Chaldea, Ur of Chaldea, is Babylon. God called Abraham out of Babylon. Just as Abram, was from Babylon, right? He lived there. His family was there. He went to school there. He grew up there. Abraham breathed Babylon, right? His friends, everything that Abraham knew was Babylonian. This is so important to understand how somebody who grows up in Babylon 
God has the power to completely remove this wicked system's influence from their life completely in one generation when properly submitted to the Heavenly Father. Check this out. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. We're going to look at the life of Abraham, and we're going to see as quickly as we possibly can how Abraham overcame the Babylonian influence. And as we look, we're going to see that he was submissive instantly to the word of God. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4. And the Lord, now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto the land that I will show you. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless you, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed, as the Lord spoke unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Very important to understand. God told Abraham, leave, and Abraham left. The word of God came to Abraham, and Abraham submitted to the word of God. 75 years old. Abraham was not a spring chicken. When you're 75 years old, you don't necessarily want to go to the kitchen. Right? You are settled in your ways. You have established a life and you are now beginning, probably already established in retirement. Right? And God calls Abraham out of his family, out of the place that he grew up, out of everything that he knows. How do you think Abraham felt when this experience took place? He probably wasn't like necessarily too happy about it. But God made a promise. God made Abraham a great promise. And Abraham submitted his own heart's desire to the word of God and believed in the promise of God, even though he did not see it. This is very important. This is where we see Abraham beginning to get victory over Babylon. And as Abraham takes the first step out of Babylon, it's because he submitted to the word of God. Probably didn't feel good for Abraham to do that, right? So too, we are called out of Babylon and its false apostate teachings. When we are confronted with this, how does it make us feel? It, we don't feel good. I remember when I was called out of Babylon, I remember... There was large parts of my life where I was extremely disappointed. I can't go to this church anymore that I love because they're teaching falsehood. I was very popular in that church. There was nothing wrong with that church except it didn't follow the word of God. And I had to come out. And my heart, too, was sorrowful. But better to die than sin against the Lord. So how does it feel when God calls us out of Babylon? It doesn't feel too good, but we need to obey God just like Abraham, right? God needed to take Abram away from Babylon, his native land. He needed to take him away from his family. As Abram left Babylon, he was leaving that false sense of worship which surrounded him because that's what literally Babylon was. It was a false set of worship and Abraham was surrounded by it. And as Abraham left, God would bless Abraham with a knowledge of the one true God. This is very important for us to understand as end time disciples, as God calls us out of Babylon. Same thing that happened to Abraham is going to happen to us. As Abraham came out of Babylon, he was blessed with a knowledge of the one true God. So too, we will be blessed if we come out of Babylon. We will be blessed with a knowledge of the one true God. True worship practices through faith and obedience to God's word is what Abraham committed himself to. So too, if we're coming out of Babylon and we receive a knowledge of, of the worship of the one true God, we should set our hearts on true worship through faith and obedience to God's word. This should be our heart's desire. Let's see how the life of Abraham plays out. We saw Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, come out of Babylon, right? We saw Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, 
Abraham leaves. Abraham obeys God's word. And what's the first thing that happens after Abraham leaves Babylon? Genesis chapter 12, verses 10. And there was a famine in the land. And Abraham went down into Egypt. So Abraham gets to the place where God tells him to go and there's a famine. It's not what he expected. And he goes down into Egypt and sojourns there. For the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near unto Egypt that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold, I know that you are a beautiful woman. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me. But they shall save you alive. I say, say I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live. And it came to pass that when Abram came to, into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld his wife, that she was very beautiful. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And Abraham was treated well for her. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And Pharaoh called unto Abraham and said, Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou, She is my sister, so I might have taken her to be my wife. Now therefore, behold, take thy wife, take her, and go away. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. And they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. You see, Abraham was married to his half-sister. They had the same father but different mothers. And when Abraham told Sarah to say, when if anybody asks, you're my sister. Abraham was telling his wife to say a half-truth. Right? Half-truth is still half a lie. And what does it mean to bear false witness? It's a lie. So as Abraham is coming out of Babylon, what's the first thing that happens? He doesn't trust God and he lies, right? This is a character record of Abraham for us to learn from. Remember, he lied, he sinned, and he didn't trust God, right? Let's see how God continues to work with Abraham. Genesis chapter 13, we see Abraham and his nephew Lot. They both have a lot of substance. There's not enough room for them in that part of land. They part ways. Genesis chapter 14, a war breaks out, right? These kings rebelled against another king who had them under submission. That king came and tried to put them back under submission. He did, and he, all the cities in the area, he took all the substance, all the men, all the women, all the children, and went back to his homeland. Just so happens that Abraham's nephew Lot was in Sodom and he was taken captive. And Abraham says, I need to go rescue my nephew. We're going to follow this in verse 14 to 21. We're not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to jump into this. As war breaks out, Lot is taken. Abraham goes. He defeats these five kings. He rescues his nephew. And now he's left with this massive treasure. We want to understand that as this war broke out, Abraham won with 300 men. He rescued his family, his, his nephew, and now he's left with this massive war treasure. And this is what happens. Uh, Revela uh, Genesis chapter 14, verse 21 to 24. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abraham said, to the king of Sodom, I have lift mine hand to the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. I will not take from you a thread nor a shoe lash it, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest any of you should say that I made Abraham rich, save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me, Anner, Eshkel, Mamre, let them have their portion. This is very important to understand that Abraham is sitting with a massive treasure. According to the ways things were when it, war took place in the past, the conqueror received all of the treasure. And it was up to Abraham. He conquered these five kings. He received all this treasure. He had all these people 
as now they were now his servants. And the king said, please simply give us back our citizens. And Abraham said, listen, have everything. He's like, I'm not trying to make myself rich off of you. This shows how selfless Abraham was in that he simply wanted to rescue the people. This is a very big uh, situation for Abraham to display the character of Christ. Abraham did not seek money from war. He simply wanted the people that he loved to be safe. This is exactly how Christ is. He saved us. He went into war simply because we were in danger. It's true. In Genesis chapter 12, Abraham lies to Pharaoh. He sins and he shows that he doesn't trust God. Genesis chapter 15, we see him reflecting the character of Christ. And a, a, a pattern begins to develop. As Abraham submits himself to the word of God, we see he begins to reflect the character of Christ more and more and more. So he in Genesis chapter 12, he, he, he submitted to the word of God. It's true. He lied, he sinned, and he, he didn't trust God. But we see that the character of Christ is beginning to be portrayed in his life. Right? Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 says this. After these things, after the war, after everything that happened, after these things, the word came unto Abraham. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. You see, Abraham was a man of peace. He wasn't a warrior. And when he went and fought against these five kings, now he had five different nations seeking revenge. And this has plagued Abraham's mind. And God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I am your shield. I am your protector. I am your exceeding great reward. Even after Abraham was in a war where he probably killed people, even after Abraham lied and distrusted God in Egypt, God comes to Abraham and says, I still love you. I am still your shield. I am your exceeding great reward. This is very important to understand the nature of God compared to what how Abraham is dealing with coming out of Babylon. Did Abraham come out of Babylon and did he instantly stop lying? Did he instantly start trusting God 100%? No, but he's obeying God's word. That's what's important. He's obeying God's word. And the more he obeys God's word, the more he develops the character of Christ. God tells Abraham, I am your shield. I am your defense. I am not leaving you. Genesis chapter 15, verses 7 to 11. And he said unto him, I, this is God speaking. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought you out of Babylon to give you this land to inherit. And he said, Lord, where shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and he divided them in the middle, and laid each piece against another, and, but the birds he did not divide. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep Sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, great horror and darkness fell upon Abraham. God commands Abraham to make a sacrifice. This is the word of the Lord coming to Abraham now. And what does Abraham do? Abraham instantly obeys the word of God. This is important. This is important. Because every time God commands Abraham to do something, he does it. He, his character is a little off. But as he obeys God's word, his character develops more and more into the image of Christ. Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abraham, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray, go into my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of his wife, and, Sarah's, and Sarah 
Abraham's wife took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram, and went and dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave to her husband Abram to be his wife. So here we see a scenario. Sarai is not bearing children, and she says to Abraham, Take my maid and have children through her. Is this God's will? This is absolutely not God's will. This is a mistake Sarah makes. This is very important to understand that this is not God's will. Verses 5 to 6. And Sarah said unto Abraham, let's go back to verse 4. And he went into Hagar. Abraham had sex with Hagar, and she conceived a baby. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress Sarah was despised in her eyes. And Sarah said unto Abraham, My wrong be on you. This was, this was Sarah's idea. And she says, My wrong be on you. I have given my maid into your bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord's judge between me and you. Very important. Is Sarah and Abraham reflecting the character of Christ here? Let's be honest about this. Sarah and Abraham are not reflecting the character of Christ here. Now, imagine with me. Sarah has a baby at this time in her life. What kind of character is she going to give to the baby? She's going to give a character that cannot be blessed by the Spirit of Christ. This is very important, that we can see why God is waiting to give Abraham and Sarah a child, right? That their character isn't right. They're doing things that just isn't right. And the plans that God has for them, they need to have a different character. This is, this is very important to understand why the, the, the birth of Isaac took so long. Because there was a character development in both Abraham and Sarah that needed to take place. And if they had the child, Isaac, now they would pass Bad character trait on to Isaac. Very important. Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 to 14. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 14. And when Abraham was 99 years old, 99, and when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and you and it will multiply you exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name be any more Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will come, and, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to your seed after you. I will give unto you and to your seed after you the land where you are a stranger in the land of Canaan for everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou wilt keep my covenant, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and your seed after you. Here it is. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. This is a commandment of God that is given to Abraham. This is Abraham receiving the word of God. And ye shall circumcise your flesh, your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight years old, and he that is eight days old, remember this, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or, brought with mo or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of your seed, he that is born in your house and he that is bought with money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. 
And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from this people. He has broken my covenant. Very important. A promise. God gives Abraham a promise. I'm going to bless all of your seed. They're, I'm going to be their God. They're going to be my people. He gives Abram a name change. Abraham. That represents a character change. Very important. And he goes and he says, there's going to be a contract between me and your people. That contract is symbolized in the circumcision. Right? And he says, from eight days old, anybody who's in your house and worships me must be circumcised. If they're not circumcised, they have nothing to do with me. Check this out. Genesis chapter 17, 23. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin the same day. So God gives Abraham a command, and what does Abraham do? He does it the same day. He doesn't wait. He doesn't make excuses. He doesn't think things over. He said, God says it. I do it. This is very important. Abraham obeys immediately. This is developing a Christ-like character. How did Christ obey the Father? Immediately. Very important. We see as Abraham obeys God's word, he develops the character of Christ more and more. And as he develops the character of Christ more and more, the mind frame the influence of Babylon is being left behind. Genesis chapter 18, verses 23 to 30. Abraham takes in angels, and he feeds them, and, and he is a very good host to them. And they reveal their plan of uh, going to check out Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham knows that Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be destroyed. So here we see Abraham in a position where he's, expressing the character of Christ. Abraham, uh, Genesis 18, 23 to 30. And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you destroy and not spare the place for 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from you to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And Abraham's talking to God now. And the Lord said, If I find inside of fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have spoken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Here Abraham is saying, I am dust, I am ashes. Abraham is very humble before the Lord. Abraham is standing in the sinner's place. And this is what he says. He said, maybe, what if there's less than five people? What if there's 45 people who are righteous? Will you destroy the city for a lack of five? And he said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he, Abraham, spake unto him yet again and said, maybe... There shall be forty. And he said, I will not destroy it for forty. And he said unto him, O oh Lord, be not angry, and I will speak. Maybe there's thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty. And he said, Behold, now I have spoken upon thee unto the Lord. Maybe there's twenty. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, O oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet this one more time. What if there be ten? And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as he left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. Very important to understand that Abraham is standing in the gap for Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember what happened in Genesis 14? Abraham rescued Sodom and Gomorrah with the sword when he defeated the five kings. Now, the Lord God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah 
And Abraham is standing as an advocate for the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's saying, please don't destroy if there's this many. And he's being an advocate with God, saying, please have mercy. And he, he's, he's dwindling the numbers down to almost like 10 people. There's probably hundreds of thousands of people in these cities. And so Abraham is being an advocate with God, right? This is displaying the character of Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, And we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Abraham is portraying the character of Christ here as he is standing for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is very, very, very important to see. The more Abraham obeys the word of God, the more he reflects the character of Christ. This is a pattern. The more Abraham submits to the word of God, the more he reflects the character of Christ. Genesis chapter 19, we see Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. There was not even 10 righteous, right? We saw that there was one righteous. That was Lot. And, but even though God destroyed um, Sodom and Gomorrah, he saved every single righteous person that was found in the city. So God um, actually kept his word to Abraham and saved all the righteous. Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. And Abraham journeyed from there toward the south country and dwelled in Kadesh and Shur, sojourned in Gerur. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister, and Abimelech, king of Gerur, sent and took Sarah. Genesis chapter 20, 1 and 2, Abraham does it again. He lies, and he doesn't trust God again. It's very important to understand that Abraham is a human being, right? Abraham is a sinner. Abraham's faith isn't necessarily where it needs to be, even though... He has a track record of God providing, of God saving, of God loving. Who's this remind us of? This reminds us of us. We also have a track record that God loves us. We also have a track record of God saving us. We also have a track record of everything that God does for Abraham, he does for us. And yet, the Bible reveals that Abraham's faith sometimes isn't what it should be. And Abraham, when it comes down to it, he is a sinner. But there's one thing that sets Abraham apart is that when the word of God comes to Abraham, he obeys it immediately. Genesis chapter 21, verse 4. This is very, very, very important. Genesis 21, verse 4. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham is immediately obedient, right? God said, if you have a child born in your house, on the eighth day you circumcise him. Abraham remembers God's word, even though time passes, 10 years, whatever, and he still continues to be obedient to God's word immediately. Genesis chapter uh, 21, verse 9. Now remember this. Isaac is born, but at this point, Abraham still has another son, Ishmael, who's 13 years old. 13 years old when Isaac is born. And for 13 years, all Abraham knew was his son, Ishmael. He poured everything into Ishmael all his love, all his energy, all his knowledge, all his time was in Ishmael. Abraham was 90 years old. He didn't know how long he was going to live. He was trying to fortify his son the best he could. So he spent as much time as he could with Ishmael, teaching, 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 learning, learning, learning. And now Isaac is born, right? And he loves Ishmael. But this is what happens. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, Ishmael, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking Isaac. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, 
For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was grievous in Abraham's sight, because Ishmael was his son. He loved him. And God said unto Abraham, Let it, but, let it be not grievous in thy sight, because of the lad, and because of thy bondwoman. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, listen unto her. For Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent them away. The word of God came to Abraham and said, You love this boy dearly. You need to let him go. And what did Abraham do? with his only son for 13 years. He was obedient to the word of God above his love for his child. That sounds harsh. That sounds so harsh. But God blessed Ishmael and made him an exceeding great nation. And if I remember correctly, 12 kings came from him. It wasn't about abandoning his son. It was about being obedient to God's word. And Abraham did not put love for others above love for God. Very important. This breaks Abraham's heart. Giving up Ishmael, this broke, absolutely broke Abraham's heart. Yet he obeys. Even in the hardest commands from God, Abraham obeys. This is our example. This is the track record. Guess what we're going to see? What happened every time Abraham obeyed God's word? A character development took place where he became more like Christ. What If Abraham just obeyed God's word, what are we going to see next? We're going to see Abraham displaying the character of Christ. That's the track record. That's what we see. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 3. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 3. And it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham... And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee unto the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains that I will tell thee of. That I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And Abraham cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which the Lord God had told him. Instant obedience, even though his heart was broken. He didn't understand what God was doing. Offer my son as a burnt offering? That's what the pagans did. God knew, or Abraham knew that God did not call for pagan sacrifice. Abraham did not understand what God was doing. Abraham spent all night in prayer saying, Lord, tell me this isn't you. Tell me this isn't you, Lord. But that the Lord never came. And he obeyed the commandment of God. Though he did not understand it, he was obedient to it. 5 to 8. Genesis 22, 5 to 8. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come unto you again. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they both went together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, a, the fire... And the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And they both went together. Isaac speaks. Abraham answers with trust in God. Abraham was commanded to slay his son. He didn't know what was going on. He didn't know what was going to happen. All he knew that he trusted God. That's all he knew, was that he just trusted God. Verses 10 to 11. And Abraham stretched forth his hand 
took the knife to slay his son, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon my lad, neither do thou anything. For I know that thou fearest God, saying that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, "My, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. Here, Abraham is given the promise of the Messiah. Why? This is so important. Hear me on this. God delayed Abraham and Sarah giving birth to Isaac until they both learned the principles of love, submission, obedience, and nurturing a Christ-like character. I'm going to say that again. God delayed Abraham and Sarah giving birth to Isaac until they both learned the principles of love, submission, obedience, and nurturing a Christ-like character. Now, they've learned to do that. Now, Sarah and Abraham both love. They both submit. They're both obedient. They both nurture a Christ-like character. So much so that they can pass that on to Isaac. This is why God waited so long so that Abraham and Sarah could cherish love, submission, obedience, and nurturing a Christ-like character and that they would pass that on to their child. And when Abraham offered up Isaac, he was reflecting the character of the father. Typologically, Abraham didn't know what was going on, but Abraham was being an example to the whole universe of the sacrifice of the father and the son in heaven. Isaac reflects the character of Jesus in a very excellent way as he did not resist the father in the sacrifice. This is very important. Check the biblical record. There is not a word of Isaac not submitting to the father. This is a very excellent typological example of Christ's sacrifice, as he willfully submitted to the father in heaven. Right When it was time to lay down his life, Isaac trusted the father. Isaac showed the same perfect, trust and obedience to Abraham as Jesus did the father. See how important it was for Abraham to come out of Babylon, submit to the word of God, and that Babylonian worship, that Babylonian influence would be put away and a Christ-like character would be developed as Abraham submitted to the word of God. Very important. Very important. Abraham and Sarah come from Babylon. That's where they come from. That's where they were They were born in Babylon. That's all they knew. And Sarah and Abraham had a lot of learning. Let's say maybe they had a lot of unlearning to do. They both made mistakes. Abraham made mistakes. Sarah made mistakes. All the way, along the way, from the beginning right until the end, they made mistakes. These mistakes delayed the birth of Isaac, right? Because they were ref they were struggling, they were fighting to develop the character of Christ. And because they could not develop the character of Christ in a quicker manner, the birth of Isaac was being held back and held back and held back until they embraced love, submission, obedience, and nurturing a Christ-like character. Because that was the only way that they could pass on to the next generation a Christ-like character so that ultimately it would be passed down the line, down the line, down the line, until the Messiah would be born. Very important. Many trials, many lessons Abraham and Sarah 
had to go through, right? They had to go through many trials. They had to go through many lessons so that they were able to allow God to put in Isaac the spirit of Christ. They're very important. The lessons, the trials that Abraham and Sarah went through was so that they could have a character change that would allow God to use them to put the spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ, the life of Christ in Isaac, typologically. I'm talking about, I'm talking about typological, right? So much did Isaac reflect the character of Christ at a young age that he was willing to submit to death, even as Jesus submitted and was willing to die on the cross. Abraham learned to embrace and treasure the spirit of submission, even when it seemed impossible. Get rid of your son. Send him into the desert. Impossible. Go and sacrifice your son on that mountain. Impossible. But Abraham did trust God, and he was obedient to God's word. Now, at this point on the mountain, Babylon is completely removed from Abraham, right? The influence of Babylon on his mind, the influence of Babylon on his character is completely removed. There's no more Babylon. Babylon came out of Abraham, right? You can come out of Babylon, but that doesn't mean Babylon came out of you. When you submit to God's word and you go through the trials and you go through the lessons, Babylon comes out of you. And it's amazing to think how God was able in one lifetime, in one generation, from the time Abraham was 75 to 120, that's about 40, 45 years, one generation, God was able to take Babylon out of a person. That's not impossible for us. The same thing can happen to us. It's amazing to think how God has the ability to destroy the corrupting, the mystical death grip, which Babylon has on the mind of Abraham. And when Abraham, and then have Abraham pass the character of Christ to Isaac, right? Abraham was entrenched in Babylon. That's where he lived. God took him through trials and lessons. And as Abraham submitted to the word of God, he became more Christ-like. So much so that he was able to pass that to his kids. Very, very, very important that the journey of Abraham, as he left Babylon, with all of its negative influences, that Babylon leaves on the mind. That's what happens with spiritual Babylon. Spiritual Babylon does the same thing. It leaves negative influence on the mind, which warps and contorts our view of God, right? This is an example of how God can develop in us a perfectly submitted character, filled with love, filled with submission, filled with obedience to God's word, filled with a loving, nurturing, embracing spirit of Christ-like character. They're very important. So I'm going to say it again. The example of Abraham shows us that God can, in one generation, develop in us a perfectly submitted character filled with love, submission, and obedience to God as we embrace and nurture a Christ-like character. This is an excellent example of how to come out of Babylon, right? Question, was Abraham sinless? In this example of how to come out of Babylon, was Abraham sinless? No. Abraham was not sinless. There's a clear record that Abraham sinned multiple times. Did Abraham trust God perfectly? No. Abraham did not trust God perfectly. Did Abraham make mistakes? Yes. Abraham wasn't sinless. Abraham uh, made mistakes. Abraham did not trust God perfectly. That's in the track record. Question, what was it that caused Abraham to escape the corrupting power of Babylon and reflect the character of Christ? We know that it was submission to the word of God. The more Abraham submitted to the word of God, the more he reflected the character of Christ. Boom. Abraham submitted to the word of God Immediately, the next thing you know, he's reflecting the character of Christ. That's the record. That's the track record 
of the biblical uh, of the biblical standard of our example in Abraham leaving Babylon. That's what we see: submission to the word, developing a Christ-like character. Coming out of Babylon, submitting to the word, developing a Christ-like character. Very, very, very important. Abraham was perfect in submission. Abraham was perfectly submitted to God's word. Genesis 26.5. Genesis 26.5. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my laws, and my statutes. Whenever God said something, Abraham did it immediately. Abraham was perfectly submitted. This is so important for us as end-time disciples to understand this. Are we going to sin? Yes. Are we going to make mistakes? Yes. Are we going to trust God perfectly? No. But God is calling us to be submitted as we look back at the example that God left us, right? He gave us He gave us an example how to come out of Babylon in the life of Abraham. Babel, Abraham was from Babylon. That his, that's all he knew. And as he submitted his life to the word of God, he developed a Christ-like character which is coming out of Babylon, right? What can we learn from this? This is so important. What can we learn from this? Is God going to leave us if we sin like Abraham, right? If I sin like Abraham, is God going to leave me? No. God is my shield. God is my exceeding great reward. God does not leave nor forsake me. Hebrews 13, 5. If I sin like Abraham, is God going to leave me? No. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Here we go. Hebrews 13, 5 says this. Let your conversation be without greed and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what God said to Abraham. That's what God says to us. If I sin like Abraham, is God going to leave me? No, he will never leave us nor forsake us. Is God going to leave me? If I don't perfectly trust him like Abraham, Abraham didn't perfectly trust him. Is God going to leave me if I'm like Abraham and don't perfectly trust God? No. Jeremiah 31, 3. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. God's love for us is everlasting. He's not leaving us. He's drawing us to him. Very, very important. What does God expect from me? Right? The same thing that God expected from Abraham is what God expects from us. Obedience to God's word. Submission. Perfect submission. That's what God expects. And a lot of people try to become sinless and try to stop making mistakes and try to trust God before they submit. It's impossible. Impossible. You cannot become sinless. You cannot stop making mistakes. You cannot trust God without submission. That's the example that Abraham gave to us. Instant, perfect submission to God's word. Because in submission to God's word, we have all, all of us have Babylonian corrupting influences that need to be removed from our mind. All, you, me, them, there, everyone. We all have Babylon in us, right? And the quicker we submit to God's word, the quicker Babylon will come out, right? The quicker Babylon comes out, the quicker Christ will come. That sounds like a funny statement, but it's true. Does God want us to stop sinning? Yes, God wants us to stop sinning. Does God want us to trust him? Yes. Does God want us to stop making mistakes? Yes. But the only way that's going to happen is after the spirit of Christ dwells in me, right? Giving me a character change. The only way that's going to happen 
is if I'm submitting to God's word. Because as I submit to God's word, the more Christ-like I become. And the more Christ-like I become, then I stop sinning. Then I start trusting. Then I stop making mistakes because God's spirit is in me. And the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, God's mind, God's life, God's righteousness is guiding me through life. And as I trust him to guide me, to live in me, I'm not going to make mistakes because he's, he's helping me make uh, right judgments. That's John 16, 13. That's John 16, 7, and 8. So for us to get the things that we want, to stop sinning, to trust God, and to um, stop making mistakes, we need to be submitted to God's word. So many of us beat ourselves up. So many of us beat ourselves up because of sin, because of the mistakes we made, because we don't trust God. When God is looking for us to be submissive to his word so that as we submit to God's word, then we'll trust him. Then we'll stop sinning because we become Christ-like. I'm not talking about being righteous in my own, in my own righteousness. I'm talking about Christ living his life in me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he will keep me from falling. He will keep me from sinning. That's what I'm talking about. Right? And when God is looking for submission, and we don't want to submit. We want to stop sinning. We want to trust God. And we want to not make mistakes. But we don't want to submit. It's impossible. It's never going to happen. The track record is clear. Babylon can be taken out of us. When we come out of Babylon, we submit to God's word. A Christ-like character develops, and we then become willing to be obedient to God to the point of death. That's the track record. We leave Babylon. We submit to God's word. We develop a Christ-like character, and then we're obedient to the God where we would rather die than sin. That's the way it goes. It's, there's not another process. and we, we need to understand this so that we need to understand so that we can do God's will, so that we can prepare for the second coming. 1 John 2, 5. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. But whoso keepeth in his word, in him truly is the love of God perfected, Hereby know we that we are in him. When we keep God's word, we consider God more important than we consider ourselves. We develop a Christ-like character. Is it possible to come out of spiritual Babylon? Yes. The track record that God gave us, the track record that God gave us in the life of Abraham is clear. Come out of Babylon. Submit to God's word. You will develop a Christ-like character, and as you develop a Christ-like character, the more and more you submit to God's word, the more and more of Christ's spirit will dwell in you. And as you have Christ dwelling in you, you would rather die than sin. That's coming out of Babylon in the life of Abraham, and I, think, I thank God that he gave it to us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, we bless you, and we know that you love us. We know that you have provided all things for us to be successful. So we praise you, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for provision, we thank you for salvation, we thank you for creation, we thank you for the angels, we thank you for the protection that you saw us safely through the day. We thank you for Bibles, we thank you for freedom of internet, and we thank you just for being who you are, loving and kind and generous. We ask, Lord, that you would wipe our minds and our lives completely free from Babylon, its influences, and its uh, worship style. We ask, Lord, that you would make us instantly submissive and that we would embrace and nurture a loving, submissive, obedient, Christ-like character and that you would put within us a mind that would rather die than sin against you. We thank you. We praise you and we bless you for you are holy. And as we part ways, Lord, we ask a special protect, hazard protection around all of those who studied with us, who will study with us. 
And Heavenly Father, we ask that you would hold back the winds of strife and that you would continue to work in our hearts and minds and seal us for that day of your son's coming is very soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love y'all. I love y'all. <laughs>